Yo, what is up everyone? It is The Beast. Welcome back to the channel The Beast On. Do me a favor before we get to what happened in Tallahassee. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell that's next to the subscribe button. That lets you know when new videos drop. And hit the thumbs up button and tell Google, hey, this is a pretty decent video. Tell other people about it. And don't forget to join me after every game and every big Canes news story on Twitter Spaces. Just follow me on Twitter at Miami Radio Beast. Join me there. We can do an old school little sports talk show. Huh? Yeah, where you can have your voice heard and I'll respond and we'll yell at each other and have a great time. Do that. <laughs> Let's get to it. The Miami Hurricanes fell in disastrous fashion to Florida State. 31-28, to Doak Campbell Stadium, Bobby Bowden Field up in Tallahassee. And this game reminded me of a play with three acts, right? The start of the game is Miami looking like they're going to get blown out. Then the second act would be Miami looking like, okay, they're on the comeback. Uh, they, uh, met FSU at the, uh, the logo, Manny's jumping up and down, doing jumping jacks, and it looked like, uh, the fire was in their eyes, and they were going to come back and beat FSU, and then the third act was just, this, whatever, the last two minutes of that game, which was mismanaged, misplayed, and disastrous for Miami, and they lost the game, um, and so Miami now is 5-5 five and five overall, still not bowl eligible. The other thing is FSU could theoretically make a bowl game. Now uh, Miami could have, could have ended that for them as FSU is 4-6. Uh, um, Miami 3-3 three and three in conference play, FSU 3-4 and four in conference play. But the, you know, I didn't want to care about this game, which is sad because as an alum of the University of Miami, as a diehard fan for 40 plus years, um, you always want to care about Miami and Florida State. But, you know, this season has just been so up and down um, that I just wanted to go into this game with no emotions, and that, was, that wasn't that was going to happen. As soon as the kickoff happened, I cared about the game. Because it's Miami and Florida State, man. And I just, I don't... <sighs> The last three games have been great for the University of Miami. They've looked like a different team. They look like the kids really were hanging on and fighting for Manny Diaz. And the way they came out yesterday with eight penalties in the first quarter, it just was a mishmash of crap, really, is what it was. And it's not a way you're ever going to win a game on the road at Doe Campbell Stadium, I don't care what their record is or how good or bad they are. You're just not going to win that way by shooting yourself in the foot that many times. I mean, to have 105 penalty yards uh, on 14 penalties is just uh, unheard of. And Manny's excuse, I was on the post-game press conferences last night. I actually asked Manny about the penalties. That was my question. And his response was, you know, our kids were overhyped. And I'm thinking to myself, overhyped for Miami and Florida State, like, we're going to use that as an excuse? Like, as soon as I heard him say overhyped, I'm like, oh, God, this is like long walk from the locker room at Duke and like Al Golden telling us that there's too many primetime games. Like, you can't talk about the kids being overhyped when it's Miami and Florida State. No, it's it's lack of discipline. It's lack of focus. It's just being boneheaded. And to add insult to injury, here comes Corey Flagg, the linebacker, um, who was honest and basically told us, hey, man, we've been committing these penalties in practice. It's been sloppy in practice. So it wasn't really a surprise to me that we've been doing it in the game and that we did it in the game. Yeah, I, I knew that was going to happen because our practices have been sloppy. When I heard that, man, I just, like, I couldn't even. That's, I just couldn't. I was just like, oh, okay. That explains a lot. Um, and for all of the... First of all, let's do this. That that game was not lost because of Tyler Van Dyke. Okay, yes. I saw people being like, oh, there's the Wonder Boy having a bad game. I mean, I, I guess. I mean, 
25 of 47, you know, so just over 50%. Not great, but okay. 360 yards, four touchdowns. He did have two interceptions. It wasn't his best game, and and but Tyler Van Dyke was not the reason you lost that game. Tyler Van Dyke still has so much upside and looks so good and has so much promise. I'm good with Tyler Van Dyke, okay? Or as they're calling him now, Tyler Van Dimes. I'm good with him, okay? Did he look uh, out of his out of sorts to begin the game? Yeah, but first road start in a stadium like Doe Campbell with the chop going and all that stuff. And by the way, uh, and I was at my friend Michael's yesterday, and uh, like I don't care about the the Seminoles supposedly saying, "Hey, it's okay." But like, how are we kind of trying to in this country, you know, not disrespect Native Americans, but you know. The Seminoles are happy to... What, anyways, sorry. I didn't mean to get woke on you for a moment. Um, so let's not blame this one on Tyler Van Dyke. Um, let's, bla let's, let's look at this. The play calling was shitty, um, except for a couple of creative plays. Or, I, I just feel like every time I was watching the television, it was a counter or a delay into the middle of the defense. And uh, Jalen Knighting getting no yards. What did he finish with? 16 carries for 32 yards. Yeah, that's not going to get it done. I'm sorry. Um, and I, I know there's a theory I got hit with on Twitter that, oh, well, the reason why we keep running up the middle is because that's where our best blocking is. Uh, I mean, maybe. But if you keep doing it and the defense knows you're going to do it, well, then it kind of negates that blocking because they know what you're going to do. So let's try to get a little more creative in the run game. Can we please or come up with some more creative plays? I don't I don't understand what's happening there. Um I, it was good to see, you know, Will Mallory get a little bit involved. It was good to see Mike Harley make an amazing catch. Uh it was good to see Charleston Rambo. I think he had what, 96 yards, 95 yards. Uh continue to look like, you know, what a great acquisition in the portal he was. Um but just defense, not being able to tackle again, and their quarterback being able to run up the middle, and just poor play calling at times, especially at the end of the game. I mean, sequence, right? Punting on fourth down um, when they probably should have gone for it because if they pick up that fourth down, the game's over. They punt on fourth down. It's not downed you know, inside the five when it could have been um, a 59-yard pass is allowed to be c completed. Uh, and then on that fourth down, on the fourth down play that the Seminoles had to literally rush three and drop seven. Um, well, first of all, let's start with the first part of that. Listen, I, I get that Travis, you know, can make some moves with his feet and whatever, and you are you feel like if you rush a bunch of guys and he's able to miss the first one and he gets away and he can run. It's a problem, but you know what? Uh, let's, let's put some faith in our defense, um, somehow and let's bring the house and just see if we can rattle him and to make a bad throw. Maybe it's a pick. Maybe it's an, uh, an incomplete pass, but you know, it's fourth and long. It's fourth and whatever it was. Was it fourth and long? I don't remember, but all I know is that they picked it up dropping seven and a guy's able to make a catch right in the middle of the defense. So not only did your coaching fail you because I think they should have rushed more than three, but your players failed you because you're dropping seven and they still allowed a guy to make a clean catch in the middle of the defense, right? Um, so that was piss poor. And then, you know, it, at that point, you just, to me, I know it's, you know, the unwritten rule, but you just let them score. Because now you're just wasting clock. And then we saw, you know, there was a replay. And then Manny waited 12 seconds to call a timeout. And uh, it's just, uh, and then you use burn the second time. Just let him score. Okay, let him score. And then you have over a minute left or about a minute left to, to go down the field. And you still have your timeouts. You still have your two timeouts to go down the field and try to kick a field goal. Right. Instead of what happened at the end, which was whatever, 20 something seconds and not knowing the rule about spiking the ball and needing three seconds. Although I'll be honest, I didn't know the rule. Evidently it changed six or seven years ago.
But evidently, uh, Tyler Van Dyke didn't know the rule, and Rhett Lashley may have not known the rule, and it was just a cluster, an absolute cluster. Um, yeah, I just thought it was some really bad coaching decisions, both sides of the football and from the head coach. Um, and again, we saw bad tackling and um, just unheard of penalties, and it was a crap show. And you lost your rival, and you probably, you know, there was recruits there, and it, that impacts that. And here we are with Miami at 5-5, five and 3-3 five and three and three in the conference. You know, do they, do they, do they split uh, the games uh, that are left and get to six in, in, in six? I don't know. Do they win both? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen from here. Here's what my question is, is, you know, through the, the, this middle part of the season, the players really, despite what was going on in the locker room, and we've all heard about the fights and the brawls and the practice and the locker room and the whatever was going on, despite all that, when it came to game day, this team played for Manny Diaz. They, they, they hung together, they stayed together, and they played for Manny Diaz. And one wonders, after losing an emotional game to your rival, if that's going to be the case. Or if these last two games are going to end up being just, you know, Miami players just not, not giving a bleep. Um, I hope that's not the case, but it's conceivable. And so... That brings us to the bigger... By the way, so so I'm doing this new show. It's not really a show. It's a hangout. After games, on Twitter, follow me at Miami Radio Beast. And if you're on Twitter, you'll get a notification or I'll send out a tweet. After I go through all the press conferences after the game, when I get in my car to drive home, I'm doing a post-game show called The Drive Home. And it really is like old school sports radio where I can give my opinions and then allow you guys on as co-hosts to, to be speakers and give your opinions just like in the old days where I'd punch up phone calls. And it's really cool and it's really neat. Um, and I think you should definitely join me for it. Um, so look out for that after every game. And I'm going to start doing it more after big UM events where I feel like there's a need for you guys to want to vent. So if, if there's a coach firing, a coach hiring, an athletic director firing, a hiring, uh, some recruiting news, whatever it is, I'll jump on there and we can have some fun. By the way, if you're looking to sponsor that, we get some good turnout, uh, feel free to fly into my DMs. We can create some uh, creative stuff going on. Um, and I don't think it'll be too pricey at all. So feel free if you want to get your company name out there. Um but last night on the Twitter space, on the drive home, um, as I was driving home from my friend Michael's house where I watched the game, someone, you know, said, well, you know, look at uh, Mike Norvell and what he's done now, and he beat Miami, and y listen, listen, I, I still don't believe in Mike Norvell, uh, I, I, and and whatever FSU is, did uh, does not impact what the University of Miami will do, so don't don't give me that. I don't think anyone's sitting here going, well, if Mike Norvell beat his rival and Manny didn't, that's not the calculation that's going on. Um, I just think, and, and here's my, it, it, it's not personal because I really do enjoy the company of Blake James when I'm in his company. And I give credit to Blake because he really is an incredible fundraiser. Um, and I told you last week or the week before that I think the best thing for the university actually would be to move Blake to the university side on things over on the uh, middle of campus uh, into the Ash building uh, where the administration is and let him fundraise for the entirety of the university. That's his, that's his wheelhouse. Although I'm sure he'd like to stay in sports, but he really is a great fundraiser. I think he could benefit the university in that way and find someone to run the athletic department that is more of a CEO because the feedback I've gotten from within the athletic department, from people I've talked to from that work in the athletic department every day is that there's not a lot of belief, um, at least from the people I've talked to, multiple people, 
in Blake as a leader of people, as a CEO. Um, and so I think that, that could, you know, that move would start a lot of dominoes, uh, falling, right? Cause I feel like the only thing keeping Manny Diaz as the head coach right now is that Blake, um, wants to keep him as the head coach, or at least is keeping him as the head coach. And if Blake were to be gone, uh, moves would be made in multiple areas. That's what I feel like. Um, and I don't know this for a fact. I'm just throw I'm just trying to read tea leaves and looking at things and, you know, I'm not, I'm not down there every day like I used to be and I'm not walking the halls of the Hector the Schwartz like I used to. Um, nor is that even really a thing anymore. It's, it's just not. Um, the, the access is different, but you know, the university had a great fundraiser, a great, uh, liaison with donors named Jesse Marks. A lot of you probably know him and Jesse was unbelievable at his job and well liked by the donors and everybody that he had, uh, was in contact with. And it was kind of eye raising because Jesse has multiple degrees from the university of Miami. It's his alma mater and he loves it, you know, as much as I do or anyone else that's graduated from there, even more probably. And a couple of years ago, um, a couple of years ago, he left UM, which was really eye raising to me. He went to the Dolphins for a little bit and now he's at Northwestern, um, up in Chicago. Um, and when Jesse left to me, that said, well, if Jesse leaves, and that's a guy that had been hand in hand with Blake with fundraising and, and really, you know, being there for all the major donors and helping with the Schwartz Center, um, with Jesse leaving, like that says to me, like there's something, something not right there. Like, I don't know that any one thing happened or, and I haven't talked to Jesse and I don't know this. I'm just speculating. So I apologize if I'm speculating wrong, but like all is not well if Jesse Marks is leaving the University of Miami. That was kind of a sign. And here we are today, um, where it's only, you know, gotten more obvious that a change at the top of the athletic department needed to be made. So again, it comes back to me telling you, it's all about the board of trustees and the athletic advisory board, which is a small group of people of the board of trustees that control the athletic department. It has nothing to do with Julio Frank, Although I don't think he's very good at his job as the academic rankings for the University of Miami have fallen. Um, and every other university in the state has gone up except the University of Miami. Uh, Florida State at one point was in the hundreds. Now it's tied with Miami in the fifties. And, um, you know, every other university is making academic strides. The University of Miami seems to not be, at least according to the U.S. News and World Report rankings. And um, if you're the president of the university, that's among your top tasks, aside from fundraising and your endowment and the medical school and all of that stuff. So uh, from an alum standpoint, I don't think that Julio Frank is doing a good job as president of the university, but that has very little to do with athletics because he has nothing to do with athletics. It's all about the BOT and the AAB and those people, several of whom are octogenarians and you know, probably still using flip phones, uh, are the ones that decide what goes on with the athletic department. So, and there's a lot of political stuff going on there, right? Manny Diaz and his father and political ties and, uh, you know, Gino Damare's dad, Paul being on the board of trustee. It's just, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So it's interesting to see, but I will tell you this and I have not, I'm doing something that I really probably shouldn't do, but hey, it's a new era of, uh, you know, fake news and journalism and lack thereof and just throw shit out there. So I will let you know that on a, um, how, how can I put this? There's a group of insiders, influencers, donors, old school guys with ties to the program that have a weekly chat. And I've actually been invited to uh, join join them and I've been on a couple. But someone I talked to yesterday who is a, you know, a big part of this group and was a for a long time a six-figure donor to the program annually and now is is not because of what has happened. 
um, you know, they're, they're telling me that there seems to be some, some kind of proof out there, although I have not second sources, so I don't know that the decision to move on from Blake has already been made. Um, and that he might have already been told that. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. Do I take everything with a grain of salt? Yes. Because I've been on those calls before and I've talked to people before and they've told me, there's a meeting next Tuesday at 5 p.m. and all will be decided. And then you check it out and there was no meeting. So take everything with a grain of salt. But I will say this. If, if, if Blake is at some point on his way out, then that probably doesn't bode well for Manny being uh, kept on. As for whether he's going to be let go of his duties by the time this video is up or not, I, I don't see that happening. Um, but, and there's two games left and it, I'm not sure it matters. So we'll see is the question or the, uh, we'll see is the axiom. Um, but just know that if something does go down, I will be here for you. I'll be throwing a video up on YouTube and I'll be on Twitter spaces. So follow me there. All right. That'll do it for me on this one. Sorry, Canes fans. It hurt yesterday. Trust me. It hurt. Uh, it hurt so much. I went to bed early last night. Like, I'm a guy that goes to bed, like, at 2. Uh, yesterday, I was in bed before midnight. That's how much I was hurting from that one. But we will fight on to uh, to live another day. Virginia Tech, 7.30, night game against Virginia Tech on the ACC Network on Saturday. I will see you at The Rock. And I will talk to you after the game on Twitter Spaces. And otherwise, I will see you when I see you. Peace.